भद्रम करने भी शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षीजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 So we were studying the seventh mantra, which is the most important one. Let's chant it. I'll chant it and you repeat after me. Nanta pragyam na bhish pragyam. Nanta pragyam na bhish pragyam. No bhayata pragyam na pragyana ganam. No bhayata pragyam na pragyana ganam. Na pragyam na pragyam. Na pragyam na pragyam. अदृष्टम्यवहार्यम अग्राह्यम अलक्षण अचिंत्यम्यपदेश्यम एकात्मत्ययसारम प्रपंचोपशम शात शिवम्दैत चतुर्थ मनते स आत्मा स विज्ञेय दैट वॉज द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट मंत्र इन द होल टेक्स्ट सो द फाइनल टीचिंग द हाइस्ट टीचिंग हेज बीन गिवन इन फैक्ट द रेस्ट ऑफ द टेक्स्ट इज मोर और लेस एंड एक्सप्लेनेशन to various questions arising out of this what does it mean how can we understand it how can we apply it to our lives what can be the other points of view different points of view objections what are the answers and so on and so forth for the rest of the text not only in this chapter but for the other three chapters also which will follow after this now what we have seen so far is the upanishad said like all vedanta that when you know yourself all your problems are solved how does that work because upanishad says that your real nature is the absolute brahman existence consciousness bliss an immortal existence which is not subject to decay disease or death an immortal consciousness which uh, like a sun which neither rises nor sets always blazing forth bliss ananda which is within you intrinsic to you which you do not have to beg for from outside so once you realize your own nature as that then all our your problems all our problems are at an end you have transcended suffering so knowing yourself that is the uh, way to overcome suffering how do you know yourself this upanishad says that there is it suggests a particular way the way of the four aspects of the self so how do you know yourself any kind of knowledge comes out of inquiry if you want to know something you must inquire and these things are uh, in, uh, these statements are very significant because it seems obvious yes knowledge is inquiry but that does, does not seem quite obvious in religion because religion seems to be about belief it seems to be about worship it seems to be about maybe devotion or doing good deeds or maybe some kind of um, uh, esoteric rituals or some kind of um, you know mystical experiences it does not normally seem to be about inquiry often it seems to be just the opposite but vedanta says it should be inquiry if you need knowledge you must inquire so this inquiry in this case it is inquiry into the self inquiry into yourself different upanishads different vedanta texts offer different avenues of inquiry different methodologies this one offers a particular one what is that it says that the self has four aspects 
What are the four aspects? Three of them are actually familiar to us. We know them. We experience them. The Upanishad just points it out. One of them is the waker. The self. What is the self? The I. You. I. I myself. Each of, each of us experience the self, experiences the self within ourselves as the I. We refer to it as the I. So this I has four aspects. One is the waker, which we all are right now. And the second one is the dreamer. What we are in our dreams. The third experience we have about ourselves is the sleeper. Deep sleeper, by which I mean deep sleeper. Dreamer is also sleeping, but the deep sleeper, where there are no dreams. And the Upanishad distinguished between them, saying that, what is the waker? When we are engaging the external world with the help of this physical body, sense organs, motor organs, we see, hear, smell, touch, and use our um, um, you know, hands and feet to engage with the world outside. Then we are said to be waking. When we do not use this physical body and retreat into our minds and inhabit a world imagined by our minds, uh, that is called a dream. Uh, come, come, settle down. So, we are entirely in our minds. We are, we are turned inward as it were. But there is a world there and we have a body there and all of that. At this point, you may, you may object that uh, we are using our sense organs to contact the world outside. We are interacting with the world. But that also happens in a dream. Do you see the question? If you don't see the question, you won't see the answer. That also happens. Do, do you see how it happens in a dream? Because in a dream also, we are, we are as if seeing other people and talking to other people. Uh, we don't think that we are in a dream. We don't think that we are in, in the, our heads. In a dream, when you don't know it's a dream, what do you feel like? Just like waking? Yeah, right? So why, why are you saying that? Why are you distinguishing between dream and waking? By saying in waking we use sense organs and in a dream we are entirely in our mind. Why are you saying that? Do you see the question? The answer is this. True. You are right. And that's what Vedanta also says. But remember, all this, this is an inquiry. And all this inquiry we are taking, we are doing where? In the waking. Right here. We are doing it here. So from this perspective... Isn't it quite clear that the distinction between waking and dreaming is here I am physically with my body and my, and my dream is what I was doing when I was sleeping on my bed and I was in my head. So from a waking perspective, the whole thing is discussed from a waking perspective. So the waker is the one who uses the sense organs to interact with the world. The dream is a person who, the, you when you retreat into the mind and inhabit a world created by your mind and a body created by your mind. And sleep is when everything shuts down. Uh, you experience a blankness. You neither know the world nor do you know yourself. These are the three aspects of the self. The I, which we normally are familiar with. And Vedanta says, what you really are, this I, is the fourth aspect, which it calls the Turiyam. Which it reveals as, in the seventh mantra as, this is something that is not known to us. This is actually the teaching of the Vedanta. And it is using these, these three familiar aspects as a doorway to realize the Turiyam. Why did it mention the, these three? You know, the question was raised that when you wanted to exp teach about the waker, you straight away said that consciousness which is associated with physical body, working through the physical body, externalized awareness, that's the waking. When you wanted to talk about the dreamer, you said that that um, you know, awareness which is turned inwards in sleep, uh, imagining a world, that is called a dreamer. Now when you are going to talk about the fourth aspect, you should straight away say, this is the fourth aspect. Here you straight away said, this is the waker, this is the dreamer. Say this is the, the fourth aspect, Turiyam. But what did you do? How did you define the fourth aspect? You started, remember the seventh mantra? Nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam na ubhayata pragyam. It is not the dreamer. It is not the waker. It is not the sleeper. It is not something in between. Why are doing that? 
This is the, precisely the reason why these three were mentioned first. In order to give us a platform from which to inquire. This is the golden rule of teaching. From known to unknown. Hmm. Negation, negation. Yes. What will you negate? Something that you know already. You're seeing my point. Because if you directly talk about you are the pure consciousness, you will say, what pure consciousness? What are you talking about? But if I say that you are that one reality running through, in and through all of them, and yet without their distinct properties, denying the wakership of the waker, the wakerhood of the waker, the dreamerhood of the dreamer, and the sleep properties, uh, you are neither the inward turned consciousness, you are not the outward focused consciousness, you are not the consciousness associated with the sleeping mind. No. You are the consciousness in itself. The bare consciousness alone. These three are passing visions. Like clouds passing through a sky. You are like the sky itself. These are appearances in you. This is what was pointed out in the um, seventh mantra. Where is this fourth aspect of the self? Where is it available? Right here, it is available when the waker is there. It is available when the dreamer is there. It is available when the sleeper is there. It is like the example of the gold and the three kinds of ornaments. The gold is like the reality. And the three ornaments, the necklace, the bangle and the ring. Where is the gold available? There. In, through, in and through all of them. But they are all mutually exclusive. The necklace is not the bangle. The bangle is not the ring. They are different things. But in and through all of them, the reality, underlying reality is gold. Similarly, in and through all the differences of the waker, dreamer and sleeper, the underlying reality is this consciousness continuously available. That is what we are and that is what Vedanta is speaking about. What Vedanta wants us to do is shift the reference of the I Right now, I means, I am this limited being, this body and mind, which I call Sarva Priyananda. And I inhabit a world apart from me. Uh -huh. And I struggle and live in this world. This is my idea about myself. Uh -huh. In my dream also, similar kind of idea. In my deep sleep, nothing. I don't know the world, I don't know myself also. But what uh, Vedanta wants us to do is, from this limited I, take your attention to the unlimited, limitless I which is available right now. This limited I, this uh, I which is connected with body-mind, you take your attention, shift your identity to the uh, limitless consciousness available just now. Alright? So this is what uh, the Mandukya Upanishad is trying to tell us. Notice one word. Ekatma Pratyasaram. That was one, the, one of the words used in the seventh mantra. What does it mean? How is this to be known? How can we know this fourth aspect? Remember, the fourth aspect alone is the reality. It alone appears as the three aspects. So there are actually, no, actually not four aspects. This four aspects teaching is just a methodology. These one, two, three are steps. And fourth is the goal. Yeah. Fourth is not one more step. These are steps to the goal. These are indicators to this thing. Yeah. This is the, this is the, these are doorways. All three are together constitute the doorway. By analyzing these, because these are obvious. By analyzing this, we are supposed to find out the underlying reality. Now the word used was, how do you, how do you find out the underlying reality? The word used was, Ek Atma Pratyasaram. By the one unchanging I cognition, which is available in and through all of them. Because we said that fourth one is something which is available in and through all of them, like gold in the ornaments. Now, when you look at these three, what is available in all of them? Consciousness. Consciousness is available in all of them. Consciousness itself, without its associated properties, without the apparent properties, by itself. The apparent properties come and go. The necklace and the, um, the ring and the bangle, the names are different, the shapes are different, they look different, the uses are different. But then what is common to all of them? 
gold. Similarly, the waker, dreamer and sleeper, what is common to all of them? What is the I which is common to all of them? Awareness, consciousness, which is recognized here as right now, I am. I am Sarva Priyananda, I am a man, I am here in the Vedanta society, all of these are added on. These will go away. Mm. They disappear when you are in dream or deep sleep. But I am is constant. It is here, it is here and here you will not, at that moment of deep sleep you do not think that I am sleeping. But when you wake up and look back, you claim who, who was asleep. You don't claim that somebody else was sleeping. I was sleeping. Only because the mind was not functional in deep sleep, you could not think it at that time that I am sleeping. Alright, this is what the seventh mantra told us. Now, um, Gaudapada is going to take a break. He is going to uh, write his karikas, his commentaries. We have come across a very important juncture in the teaching. Maybe the most important part of the teaching in the Upanishad. Now Gaudapada is going to start, um, d d you know, he's going to start his, d d do his thing. Explain, <laughs> explain what is, what has been taught so far and what are its implications. So let us go to the Karika. And don't get confused, seventh mantra belonging to the Upanishad. But Karika number 10. Because you remember earlier he has written nine karikas, nine verses. So karika number 10. I will chant the karika, please chant after me. He is just going to summarize the teaching of the seventh mantra and then draw out its implications. Tenth karika. Nivritte sarva dukhanam. Nivritte sarva dukhanam Ishana prabhuravyaya Ishana prabhuravyaya Advaita sarva bhavanam Advaita sarva bhavanam Devas turyo vibhusmritaha Devas turya vibhusmritaha So the word turiyam is introduced by Gaudapada. Remember, the Upanishad does not use the word Turiya. The word Turiya here is introduced by Gaudapada. Here in this in this verse, the tenth verse, it says Turiya. Um, what does Turiya mean? It just means fourth, number four. It's a Sanskrit word for four. Upanishad uses what word? Chatur. Chaturtham, fourth, which means fourth. But the word Turiya has caught on. So you have Swami Turiyananda, and Brahman is called Turiya, and so the word Turiya meaning the fourth, many people don't even know it means the fourth. They know that in Vedanta it means the absolute. Um, so that is the word Turiya. What was said about the Turiya in the seventh mantra? That is being summed up very beautifully here by, uh, the essence of it is being summed up here by Gaudapada. What is this Turiya? It says, Ishana Prabhu. Ishana means the Lord. Isha means God. Isha means God. And another term for uh, God in Sanskrit is Prabhu. So the same word has been used, uh, same uh, term has been used. Ishana means the Lord. Prabhu means the Lord, the God or the Lord, the Almighty. The... But here, the word is technically used. Normally, when you say in religion, God, you mean the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, the creator of the universe and so on and so forth, the, the deity in all theistic religions. But here it means, why is this consciousness, the pure consciousness, the reality within us, why is it being called God? Why is it being called Ishana? What is its power? Ishana means powerful, all-powerful. What is its power? Its power is the removal of all suffering. What is the power of, of this, this story within us? What does it do? The moment you know it, all suffering is removed. And therefore it says, that's why I'm going backwards with the, with the terms. Nivritte sarva dukkhanam. 
because it removes all suffering therefore this turiya is called ishana nivritti means cessation transcendence dukkha suffering sarva dukkha all suffering it's useful to stop here and consider what has been said the various kinds of sorrows you can classify them in different ways um in hinduism it is customary to speak of three kinds of sorrows all sorrows are classified into three kinds um adhyatmika adidaivika adibhautika uh, adhyatmika means the sorrows which emanate from our own body and mind mostly the sorrows which come here physical sorrows you be sick or mental sub- uh, depression uneasiness anxiety all the sorrows which which originate from this particular subjective body and mind that's one category another category is adi bhautika those sorrows which come from others in the classical sanskrit texts it will be written uh, coming from tigers and mosquitoes problems you which you might face in ancient india <laughs> no in modern india too mosquitoes are very much there <laughs> mosquitoes yes <laughs> mosquitoes mosquitoes are, are are very much there in modern india too and and even tigers i i mean i was surprised there's a gentleman who told me that when he was a young man in mumbai in the outskirts of mumbai he used to take a bus to a job in the city and um they uh, he found that the seats in the bus they, they were seats which were 1 rupee who it's in the in the place and there was a seat which was 20 paisa or something like the 50 paisa in those days which is not very long ago 20 20 or 30 years ago something like that and uh, he quickly found out why some of those seats are so cheap because if the bus breaks down at there's a particular place where it did break down usually uh, the people there would have to get down and push and that place was frequented by <laughs> panthers <laughs> so you might be eaten that that is that's why the uh, that's the price to pay for the cheap ticket uh, the seats so yes penny wise pound foolish pound foolish yes <laughs> tigers and mosquitoes well all right we will dispense with that but but in today's world it might be the sufferings that you get from other people and other living beings adi bhautika sufferings and adi daivika is the sufferings from mother nature it's too cold or too hot or there are storms uh, or there are earthquakes so by source they classified the sufferings by source of course if you look a little deeply at this classification ultimately if i am suffering it has to come finally to my body and mind so every suffering has some impact on my body and ultimately on my mind ultimately it has to come to my mind if it does not affect my mind i'm not suffering really if i don't know that i'm suffering i'm not suffering um but just by classification anyway this is one way of classifying you may classify in different ways now the question arises there are solutions for these kinds of sufferings if i have a tummy ache i know what medicine to take if i have uh, if i'm bored I, i can watch tv or do something like that or if i am uh, lonely i can go go and meet friends so there are ways you know um medicines and entertainment and so many ways of overcoming physical and mental suffering so why spirituality the answer is all of these ways of overcoming men, uh, physical and mental suffering they have two common defects one is none of them are universal some of them will remove a particular problem <clears throat> and for a particular time so some of them will remove a particular problem for a particular time um look at what it says turiya sarva dukkhanam is something that removes all sorrows for all time this is the difference it says that turiya is the lord or prabhu or ishana because nivritte sarva dukkhanam which leads to the cessation or transcendence of all sorrows for all time another defect of all the worldly means of overcoming sorrow is that none of them are sure you see they are not um they may remove the sorrow they may not even if they do remove your problem the problem is bound same problem is bound to come back again or in different forms so none of them are capable of removing all of our sorrows and even when they work they are not final solutions to our sorrows again the problems will come back in technical terms they are called atyanta 
ekanta abhava atyanta means complete total there's a lack of total solution and aikantika there's a lack of any kind of guarantee that it will remove your sorrows but that problem is not there with the turiyam in the spiritual life it's guaranteed that it will remove all your sorrows and it will be forever and guaranteed it's bound to do that that's the promise of religion basically whether you call it heaven or salvation or nirvana or turiya basically that's the promise of religion but here for the first time we begin to understand why how where are the where are the problems where are the problems in the waking state hmm? remember imagine the way the problems of the waking state do not last till the dream also you are know, hungry in the waking state you may not be hungry in the dream in fact it's quite possible it just be the opposite a person who is suffering from hunger in the waking state might uh, feel in mind might imagine lots of food and eating and and you know feasting in the dream state because often dreams are wish fulfillment so a problem in the dream state you're being chased by the tiger by the panther or something and you wake up with your heart pounding and you're sweating sitting on the bed there's no tiger no panther so the problem of the dream state does not last in the waking state none of these problems are there in the turiyam see you might say in deep sleep also there are no problems in deep sleep also there are no problems because you have no experience of any particular sort good experience or bad experience it's just blankness so in the deep sleep also there are no problem but there is a problem in the sense that all the problems are present in the deep sleep as seen in the seed form how do you know in the potential form how do you know because you have to wake up sooner or later you either start dreaming again or you wake up so the deep sleep is a kind of causal state where everything the is in the form causal form potential form seed form and all the problems pop up when you are in the waking and the dream now how does the turiya solve anything how does the turiya solve anything a good way to understand this is when you look at um the waker and consider your dream problems why is why do you consider that waking up solves all the problems of your dream how does that how does waking up from a dream solve the problems of a dream suppose a tiger is chasing you suddenly you wake up sitting on the bed no tiger no chasing no problem yeah, what you know it doesn't exist it's unreal it's unreal not even that it disappears mm-hmm. if it even if you don't see it it might be just the tiger is lurking in the next room who knows but you don't think that because it does not belong to this plane of existence okay. it was something imagined in your head you realize the whole thing was an imagination so it is falsified with respect to the waking the dream is falsified and helps all the problems of the dream whatever happened in the dream falsified suppose i underwent terrible injustices in the dream when i wake up all the tortures and in the injustices which i recall which happened to me in the dream my feeling of of uh, indignation of of suffering of of uh, deep sorrow when i wake up what happens i laugh it all off how come how do you laugh off terrible things happening in the dream because of one reason only because unreal. unreal it's not that you did not experience it you experienced it who saw the dream other than you you saw it and not experiencing is not the key seeing the falsity of it falsity. compare with comparison to the waking state how do you see the falsity this is real that was imagined what happens in turiya is this when you realize this where do you realize here in waking state itself you realize this is the real i this is the appearance hence no problem here affects me affects the real me that's how you transcend how does the turiyam the pure consciousness atman brahman whatever how is it that it is not affected by the problems of the three states by the waker's problems by the dreamer's terrors and anxieties and by the sleeper's potential problems how is it that's not affected i'll give you three three points one one is what are the superpowers that this one has by which it it overcomes all sufferings i'll give you the sanskrit terms first and then next because it is first of all asanga 
it is detached it is not attached to anything none of the things none of the people things and events in the waking stage stick to the turiya the moment you slip away from the waking state and experience the dream state your body does not accompany you to the dream the people in the waking state do not accompany you to the dream the problems of the waking state do not accompany you to the dream and the same is the true of the dream state the people the events whatever takes place there your own body in the dream they do not accompany you back to the waking so all the problems are left there the consciousness itself is asanga asanga means detached non attached non sticky it's it's teflon it's a the ultimate spirit is there's a just material teflon which it doesn't stick to anything yes so it's non stick yes yes it's the basis of everything how does it accomplish this trick we'll see it's it's uh, it it's no first of all notice that it's non stick not that you have to detach yourself from everything ah this is a powerful insight you are already detached from the everything in the world what sticks to you in this world no person does any person stick with you nobody they come and go does any even stick with you they come and go any thought any feeling no even the worst depression it comes and goes any tragedy medical emergency nothing it comes and goes you say okay we know that but when it is it has come and before it goes it can be terrible you say that here is the insight of vedanta adau ante yan nasti vartamani api tattha which says that what did not exist in the beginning and does not exist in the end right now it's also like that it does not exist now it just looks like that it's like a dream with respect to turiya not with respect to the waker the for the waker is terribly real so it is asanga non stick right now i'll come to you your own you cannot hold on to anything even if you want to you cannot hold on to anything even the life life itself this particular life itself you cannot hold on to it it will go away it's con- it is continuously without any any break slipping away from our fingers right now in fact the sanskrit term for the world is jagat and the derivation sanskrit derivation for jagat is gachati ti jagat that which is continuously going that is jagat we make a terrible mess trying to scrabbling to hold on to this and hold on to that till we are torn apart and scratched and bleeding because we are trying to hold on grasp you cannot grasp it will be torn away vivekananda in one of his poems he says he says give give and do not look back for he who looks back his uh, what he has given that the, the ocean becomes a drop in another place he says give because for it shall be taken from you let go uh, even while it is with you question so maybe in the dream state hmm. vedanta say you form samskaras in the dream state also um usually the samskaras are repeated and exhausted in the dream state that's what they say hmm. but samskaras are strengthened if you consciously entertain them hmm. there is this other thing in the gita which says that krishna says you burn the seeds of action hmm. by knowledge by knowledge mm. and my my question is where do the seeds of action lie are they in the sleep state that you were referring to they they lie deep within our mind, mind. which um in in the in the mind itself which which you find in the sleep state the the seeds which are there which pop up that's why when we get into our in our sleep state our experience is exactly the same think about it what an interesting thing mm. we are different people our waking stage is so different isn't it your experiences you are the what you are doing in life so different we are all different from each other different bodies different activities diff- different personal histories our minds are so different from each other thoughts knowledge desires memories so different but in deep sleep we have the same experience our waking experiences are different dream experiences are different but deep sleep same experience because blankness cannot be any different 
You can't have a different blankness and another person cannot have a different blankness. So blankness is same. But then what constitutes the difference? How, does it be, how do we come back again and be different people? Because the unknown to us, the seeds are there, those samskaras are there. Burnt means, it's a way of putting it. You find that they are all false. Uh, mithyatva, the falsity is, uh, that is what is meant by being burnt. All right. Asanga, that's one reason why the Turiya is not affected by the problems. It's the very nature of the Turiya to not to be attached or caught or be sticky with anything in the, in the dream world or the waking world, with nothing. What religion are you when you are in deep sleep? What race are you? Are you a man or a woman? Are you spiritual or worldly, scientific or uh, superstitious? Nothing. So, all of those are layers which come on and they do not stick to the uh, consciousness. But how does it accomplish, uh, accomplish this? You ask the question, it is the ground of all of this. If all of them are in this consciousness, you would expect this consciousness to be tainted somehow by this, by colored by this. How does it accomplish this? Two things I will tell you. One is because Prakashaka. Asanga means detached. Prakashaka means illuminer. Consciousness is the illuminer of everything in our lives. Are you with me here? Do you agree? Everything in your life, what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, imagine, remember, desire, like, dislike, aspire, holy, unholy, spiritual, secular, everything is illumined by your awareness. If you were not aware, if you were unconscious, what would survive in your life? So my body in uh, Mount Sinai, in a, in a respirator, it would survive. But only for others, not for you. Even your body, it's illumined by, by the consciousness which is you. So are you with me? Consciousness is the illuminer. You understand what is meant by illumination? It reveals everything. Everything means everything in your life. Even religion and God and Vedanta and all of this Turiyam and everything, this, all these ideas are revealed by the consciousness. So consciousness is the illuminer. So you say, so what? What's the point? The point is, consider another illuminer, this light. This light illumines everything in this room, right? It reveals whatever in this, is in this room. The chairs and the people and the pictures and so on, so forth. But the light itself is not affected by what it reveals. The light is not conditioned by what it reveals. In the Sanskrit text, you find this example. The sunlight falls on a pot, uh, on, on the Ganges water, it falls on a pot of wine, it falls on a pot of milk. Uh, it is not, the sunlight is not made impure by the light, uh, by, by the wine which it illumines, by, it's not made pure by the Ganges water which it il illumines. Mm. Purity and impurity, good or bad, do not touch the illuminer. So this is a principle. That which illumines is not touched by what it illumines. In that same way, the consciousness which reveals everything, by everything I mean everything, in the waking, in the dreaming, and the absence of those things in the, in the deep sleep, all are revealed by consciousness. But consciousness being the illuminer is not touched by any of these things. Not touched by their arrival, not touched by the departure. It is not touched by uh, the, the gross, the physical, in the waking state. It is not touched by the subtle, the mental, in the dream state. It is not touched by the, the sleep darkness and the, 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 um, the beej, the, the seeds in, in the deep sleep. Not touched. They come and go, they arise and disappear in sleep, uh, in, in, in that consciousness, in the illuminer. That's one reason. Now let me go to a deeper reason. Even deeper than that. Okay, before we go there, question. Yes, Noor is that they call it the light of the soul. So Noor, yes, the Sufi mystics they have this intuition. It's there in every religion. Christian mystics had it. The Sufi mystics have it. The Buddhists have got it. Um, every religion ultimately comes to this truth. 
But uh, the difference is, other than Advaita, the philosophical, logical machinery which has been deployed here, the clarity with which this is explained and revealed before us, and the ease of access which is given, especially to modern minds, which we are intellectual, we are rational, that you don't find in others. For example, if you were to ask the Sufi, okay, that sounds very beautiful and poetic. What is it exactly? Can you e explain it in other than mystical, poetical, beautiful terms? It's beautiful poetry. But other than that, can you explain it rationally to me? No, they can't. They cannot. They just realize it. Yeah, and they are mystical. They realize it in mysticism. So the Sufi path is a path of bhakti, love and mysticism, mystical experience. It's not so much an, uh, a discursive, intellectual, a philosophical inquiry. This is a philosophical inquiry. All right. Let me explain the last point. I'll come. Okay. Tell me. It is a philosophical inquiry, but ultimately it's, it's like a mystical experience. You would want it to be a mystical experience? <laughs> I, I don't I'm, I'm guessing. That's they say it's a philosophical experience. Yes, they, they say it's a philosophical inquiry in Vedanta. They'll say it's a philosophical inquiry for those who cannot get it, for lower adhikari. That means it's a, uh, let's say, then you can have various kinds of meditations which will give you mystical experiences. For those for whom it is clearly revealed, just like that, they say like, the, like a fruit in the palm of your hand. <coughs> Nisargadatta was asked, the mystical experiences great mystics had, visions of God and all of that. What about them? He never speaks about that. He said they are all true. And they require a great amount of effort to cultivate the mind so that you can make those breakthroughs and have those experiences. But ultimately all of that will culminate in this. This, this does not lead to higher mystical experiences. All the devotion in the world, the devotional uh, structures in different religions in the world, they culminate in this. It has to. All your meditation and mystical experiences ultimately leads here. If it does not, it's incomplete. I know, we are hungering for a mystical experience. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yes, you are. But, but, but why? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because you want some proof of this story of which I am. Okay, one question. Proof. Another reason? We emphasize too much on the waking state. Okay, waking state emphasis. I think, he wasn't really I think there is that yearning for, you know, seeing God, meeting Him. Yeah, that and we seeing God. Mm -hmm. Still are looking for and? Him. Deny this reality that uh, he has. Very good. Okay, so let's see. We got some, and all of them are good answers. The first one was proof. Good, we'll stop here and take a look. Proof. The second reason was, why, we, why do we want a special experience? One is, um, and the one, one person said proof, we require proof of this Turiyam. Another person said, we require, uh, we need to see God. To see, meet God. That's why it's so appealing when Sri Ramakrishna says, I saw my Divine Mother. I saw God. And that's the powerful message to the present uh, world. Okay, this seems to be like a dodge, like, you know, some kind of intellectual maneuvering which says, you already got it. You say, no, not really. Then you are too dumb. <laughs> you see, then nobody wants to be dumb, so they say, okay, maybe, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but nobody's satisfied really with this. <laughs> so I'm asking, why are we not satisfied? To see, to meet God. What else? <laughs> you said to deny this reality. or this experience. Somebody else said something else, else also, it was very uh, pertinent. Okay. Hmm? I think she said looking for an object. Already yeah, yeah. So to see or meet God, that's there. All right. Let's take them up one by one. You see, we want proof. It's like proof of what? Proof of that there is such a thing as Turiya. <coughs> beyond all these uh, waking, dreaming and deep sleep, that there is a fourth aspect called Turiyam. We need a proof of that. You know what it's like? The proof 
that you are here today is because I see it. The proof that you, that you are here. How do I know that you are here? I saw you. Okay. The proof of your existence is I have seen you. Proof of your existence in the class is I have seen you. Now, if I ask, what is the proof of, so the proof of something is that I see it. What is the proof that I have got eyes? What is the proof that I've got eyes? Ah, you can see them, but I can't see my, you can see my eyes, but I can't see my eyes. Mm -hmm. Ah, all right, let's just stop here. The, the answers are, are fundamentally different. The proof of the existence of an object is when I experience that object, when I see that object, for example. But the proof of the subject, the one who is seeing, is not because I can, I can objectify it. The very fact that I can use it to see the world is the proof of its existence. I can never see my eyes. He says, Swami, look in the mirror. If I look in, look in a mirror, I will see what? Reflection. A reflection of my eyes. I will not see my eyes directly like I see this. I can never see that. In a picture, in whatever. So, but yet I do not doubt whether my eyes are still there or not. Ask, can you see my eyes? I never ask that. Because automatically just the fact of seeing you all is proof that I have eyes. Right? Proof. What is the proof that you are conscious? To you. What is the proof that you are aware, conscious? Because when you say fourth, consciousness, pure consciousness, it all seems remote. and It's not. It's the most common thing in your life. Continuously present, continuous experiences. Now, if I ask, you say that seeing something is the proof that I've got eyes. Follow this carefully. Seeing something is the proof that I've got eyes. Seeing you is the, you is the proof that you are here. Seeing what is the proof that I've got eyes? Anything. Seeing anything. Seeing what is the proof that you are here? Only seeing you, nobody else. If I see somebody else, I cannot say that was a proof that you are here. But seeing anything is the proof that I've got eyes. Now if I ask you, experiencing what is the proof that I, I, I am conscious? Everything. Everything, anything. Anything that you experience is a proof that you are conscious. Do you have such proof in the waking state? You are conscious. Do you have such proof in the dream state? Yes. And the sleeper also. You need to reason about it a little bit. But we have, I think, shown again and again that there must be some awareness in deep sleep for which we can recall that there was a... So there is consciousness and it is proved to us by our experiences in waking, dreaming, deep sleep. You do not require any other proof. Rather, what you require is, you know what? Inquire into what you already have. Vedanta says, you already have that thurium. Then there you already have the proof that you have that consciousness. You will say at this point, okay, I see what you mean. But what good is that? That consciousness is full of uneasiness, problems. That's why we are in Vedanta society trying to solve our problems. It's nowhere near God or anything like that. That's what you think. What Vedanta does is to show you the consciousness in itself, quite apart from the incidental associated problems of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. It's self-revealing. Hmm? It's, self it's self-revealing all the time. Now, that consciousness, that's what we are trying to reveal here. We are trying to, you know, Vedanta really becomes effective when it, when you see that it is talking about something continuously available to you. It's not promising you something in the future. If I become a great yogi, this will be revealed to me. You know, in enlightenment, what will be revealed to you? You will find this awareness, this unlimited awareness as yourself and you will come to the conclusion, Oh my God, it was always there. Yeah. It's not something that I have developed as a result of lots of meditation and lots of Vedanta classes. No, it was always there. How did I never see it? Sri Ramakrishna told the story of the diamond and the washerman. We hear the story, but we don't see what it points to. A washerman in India, they beat the clothes on the, they wash the clothes in the river and they beat it on rocks and they it doesn't do too much for the clothes themselves, but it cleans them. And they dry it out and they pack it up and then deliver it back to your house. Now they sometimes use rocks for scrubbing the clothes. So this washerman, he found a nice big rock. 
but a strange rock. And it's, of course it was a big diamond, but he didn't know it. He used it for scrubbing clothes. But after some time he thought it's a strange rock. Let me ask my friend, the vegetable seller, who is more knowledgeable than me. So he takes it to the vegetable seller and the vegetable seller says, yes, it's a, quite an attractive stone. Uh, I'll give you uh, a bag of uh, potatoes for it. And then this man thinks, no, let me ask somebody else uh, who knows a little more than the vegetable seller. And finally he goes to a diamond merchant and the diamond merchant says, wow, I've never seen such a fantastic stone, such a fantastic diamond. I'll give you 10 million rupees for it. And so the whole life of that washerman was changed, became a rich person and so on and so forth. But the moral of the story is, we all have that diamond. We are using it to scrub clothes. What is that diamond? This consciousness. What are we using it for? For desiring, hating, uh, for being anxious and depressed and uh, eating and smelling and touching and tasting and remembering and forgetting and getting diseased and old age and dying. That's what we are using it for. We don't know that it is God itself. Yes. Somebody, when you say it that way, it makes the consciousness like an object, like using it hmm? for, for experiencing. Whereas it is the consciousness that experiences everything. True. So it's, uh, it's just the verbiage that confuses me. Yeah. Using it means don't think of it as uh, I am here, the washerman, this is the diamond, I pick it up and scrub clothes <laughs> with it. What is happening? The, you know the mechanism. That which is not an object, the non-objective consciousness, the pure subject, it shines upon your mind, lights up your mind so that you can think, you can remember, you can desire, you can love, you can hate. And through the mind it reveals the body and the sense organs and the motor organs so that you can see and smell and touch and hear, so that you can work and grasp and walk. So all the, the sentient activities of body and mind are powered by that. That's what I mean by use the consciousness for. That's what we are, that's the life we are leading. I'm, use, I'm using Vedantic philosophical terms. A person in a, in a more dualistic, devotional setup might say, this life which is given to us by God, it could be a blessed life and we are, we are wasting time, we are spending it in worldly pursuits and being unhappy and making others unhappy. Uh, so, that's basically putting it in a devotional theistic term. But basically you are saying the same thing. Yes. So if one were to buy this, yeah. and if we were all to buy it, hmm. it would take away the purpose of anything that happens around us. No yes and no. Anything. Yes and no. Because if you take a look, my answer would be, if you just take a look at uh, the lives of enlightened persons. Did they live lives, purposeless lives, or were their lives illumined by a higher purpose, much greater purpose than ours? You see, in every case, that's because it was a very small minority. So I guess I would say it again. If all of us bought this, yes, then there would be no reason for scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. There would be no reason for progress because it's all fake. In one sense, yes. Why would you? Uh, why would you even we worry have about it? Your consciousness. The rest yeah. is all an illusion. Yeah. So why bother? Like if we all bought it. Um, you might say so. I mean, no, it's not yet happened. Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen also. <laughs> You say, what would, what would happen if everybody became spiritual? It's not going to happen. That's the whole game, right? Hasn't yet happened so far. Yeah. Swamiji, very simplistically put, it yeah. would mean that the bunk sitting on a park bench is as, you know, he hasn't bothered uh, about the worries of getting a mortgage for his house, mm -hmm. his car, no family, no nothing. Whatever is handed to him, he eats that, yeah. wears whatever clothes are given to him. No worries, no nothing. He has. Do you think he has no worries? Do you think he has no? They are. There are some people. There are some, you know, people like that. Who, mm. Honestly, in India, definitely a new uh, guy in Bombay. Yeah, yeah. Who just did that? Lived under a bridge. Right. What you are talking about is just the polar opposite of what I am talking about. It is said in spiritual life, sattva and tamas, they look alike. They look alike, but they are not alike. Tamas, darkness, laziness, sloth, indifference. That is productive of the greatest suffering. In general, if you look at the homeless population, are you think they, do you think they are in bliss? No. 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 They are in mental, they are mental distress. They are, many of them are mentally ill. Many of them are drug addicts. Many of them have uh, uh, traumatic disorders. Uh, 
Uh, I have met a few in, in LA. We tried to help some of them. They, they are in great, great suffering. Even the person who is lazy and happy, contented, that won't last. That won't last. Let's take, let's take it one by one. That won't last. You have to take it over a person's lifetime. At least 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That won't last. At one time, either desires will come up or old age and disease will come and suffering will come and then person finds, like in the New Testament it is said, built his house upon sand. When the storm comes, it, it, it falls down, it shakes and it falls down. Thomas, laziness is, no, uh, no, is not a spiritual foundation. Sattva is just the opposite, but yes, sometimes they look alike. Uh, a classic example is when Vivekananda returned to India with uh, Margaret Noble, who was to become Sister Nivedita, and she had heard so much about India from Vivekananda. So when the ship came to the Indian coast and she saw the outline, the, the, the coast of India, and she burst out and said, Swami, how wonderful, how peaceful, what she had heard about a spiritual India. And Vivekananda scolded her. He said, no, this is not spirituality. This is not true peace. It's peaceful because it, it looks peaceful because it's a colonized land. People are superstitious under the dominion of a foreign power. They are hungry. They are illiterate. They, they do not know anything higher. It seems very peaceful. He said it is the peace of the grave. This is not spirituality. Today, compared to that, today you will find uh, tremendous disturbance all over India. There is corruption, there are uh, uh, you know, whole societies in turmoil and changing. W- do you think this is better or that is better? Yeah. This, is this is much better. Vivekananda would have been much happier to see this. People say, oh, is this Vivekananda's dream of India? I'd say very much so. This is not the end of it, but this is very much in the pro- process. It's a sign of awakening. When people struggle for their rights, people struggle for, to rise from subhuman to human levels, from the subhuman to the human to the divine. Subhuman and the divine are not the same. Okay, we've been sidetracked. But back to this point. Did you have a point to make about this? No. All right. Proof. Oh. So consciousness is its own proof. Do you need proof to the, the, the fact that you're conscious? What you need proof is that that this consciousness is the limitless, beyond suffering consciousness which you are talking about. That's what we want to see. And that's what Vedanta is trying to show us. If you understand that, this itself is proof. Then the second question was, we have this desire to see or meet God. That means you are trying to objectify it. Suppose you do see God. You do see Ma Kali like Sri Ramakrishna saw. You do see Vishnu or have a vision of Christ or something. It would be nice. It would be pleasant. It would be uplifting. And in the end, totally useless. Why? Because it leaves me as I am. Maybe a better person. Maybe a more inspired person. But I still I am. I'm going to die. I'm going to go, go, grow old and diseased and die. That's it, finished. Unless this is true. Ultimately, it must be about something within me. There is a story which was told to me by there was a gentleman who is to live in our ashram. Uh, he, he, uh, he wanted to become a monk, but ultimately he did not. His mentor, a Swami, advised him to serve his old mother and then Finally, when his mother died, he, would, he, could, he was free to come back to the ashram and dedicate his life to the ashram as a, uh, as a lay member. So he did that, that gentleman. I knew him very well. Now, in his younger days, he was very fond of visiting different swamis, reading up on books and coming and telling his mentor, Swami Premeshananda, telling him that, you know, Swami, I met this Mahatma, this Swami, and that Swami has such powers, that Swami has done such meditation, that Swami has done such spiritual practice and has these experiences. One day, Swami Premishanda told him, um, My boy, if the whole world were to turn into Sri Ramakrishna, everybody becomes Sri Ramakrishna, an incarnation of God. Ultimately, what is it to you or to me? 
When at the point of death, if you and I, we remain the same as we were, what did it all amount to? Unless you change, unless I find that spirituality within myself, have I realized that I am an immortal being? Have I realized I am the spirit? Have I realized that I am one with God? Then that's something to be, that's, that's permanent. That's really something useful. What somebody else is, what some other object, okay, there is a God, I've seen it. So, no, ultimately, it's a tremendous thing. Nothing better to see in this world than God. But even after that, it's still something that you have seen. It's something that has come and gone. Sri Ramakrishna saw God many times in the gospel you find. But the very fact that you find it many times, it means it came and go- went. But Swamiji, at the heart of it, at uh, the bottom of wanting to see or meet God, ah. is tremendous love for him. So doesn't that love change <coughs> the person? Ah, there. Does it change the person or not? So you're coming back to that? Yeah. Right? So what you are saying is, I have tremendous love for God, which will ultimately change me. In India, they have a saying, you can catch your nose like this, or you can catch your nose like this. This is the direct path. If you want to change yours, if you really want something for yourself, this is talking about you directly, without anything else, straight. The naked eye, straight, it goes there. Everything else is via media, via God, via meditation, via samadhi, via mysticism, via something else. And ultimately you say, yeah, I want, ultimately I want something for myself. You have a point? Having a vision of God, hmm. what is that? Yeah, so, so now we are, we are forced into that question now, see? I won't even try to answer that because first of all it's outside the scope. They don't even talk about it. They don't even talk about it here. Yeah. But a straight answer to that would be it's as real as seeing something else. At least as real as this. Ram Krishna said. Ultimately is it real? That's a different question. But it's as real as seeing this world. It's not an imagination. But what I'm saying here is Seeing God, any other spiritual experience, you finally, it all leads back here, does it not? Do you admit that? Yes. Yes. But we're not satisfied with just that intellectual explanation. Look at the... That's almost like an intellectual explanation. And you tell us that it's an experience that we've got to... We we feel feel the awareness. Yes. Is what you you described it to us. Right. This is a logical process, but we, we kind of like... Mystics or Ramakrishna or Vivekananda Swami, Vivekananda felt it, felt True. something, whatever I, that thing is. That, that is what we're asking. Like, how do we right. get that sense of that, whatever that is? Okay, now look at, look at the language you're using. Just an intellectual understanding and feeling something. This is the uh, dichotomy you're making? Yeah. Right? Yeah. This seems to be just an intellectual experience. Okay, let me ask you. Right. That's why. That's why. No, I, I, I see. I see the question. I see the question. Yeah, I, I, I see the question. But if you actually did it, then you'd be enlightened right now. All right. No, I'm not saying that. So I'm not saying, that if you feel that, then you should say, yeah, I'm not enlightened yet. I can see it. I can see the plan. I can see the, uh, the, what you are showing us. But that's not real to me yet. I'll, show, I'll make your question very precise and show you exactly where we are getting stuck. And what else remains. Here you need to be not emotional, but steady. Not fast, but slow. Most of you are too fast, too jerky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You have to settle down in one question for 
hours and hours and hours till you have bro broken past it. Otherwise, what will happen is the same question will come back for 25 years. Why? Because you are not listening. Same question will come back for 25 years. Don't be too eager to ask your questions. Her question is the question for everybody. If you answer her question, we have answered all our questions basically. The same question if you are on track. If a question is on track, it's a question which applies to everybody. So let's just take that question. The question of, be precise in the understanding. This is Jnana Yoga, thinking. Understanding versus experience. Okay? What has been said here, if you reduce it to bare bones, the self, you, have four aspects. That has been said here. That's the teaching. Intellectually, got it? Okay. What is the first aspect? The waker and the waking world. You understand what has been said here? One. Do you understand what has been said here? Is it an experience? No? Being awake, is it an experience? It's the most common experience of our lives. You won't have a life if you're not awake. Is it an experience? You must admit. Yes. Walk with me here. Is this an experience? Waking. Is the dreamer an experience? Yeah. Is sleeping an experience also? Yeah. Yeah. So out of the four aspects, three are already experiences, not intellectual understanding or teaching or theory or philosophy. Right? There may be teaching there, but it's already experience. This one doesn't seem to be an experience, right? Is this what you are saying? Yeah, that's why I said like, it's like, like mystic. It's like almost like it feels like it should... Like I'm trying to attain something that's almost mystical. That's how it feels to me. You can, you, you, can, you, you can use that term. But what I'm asking is, it's not a clear experience like these three, right? now. That's what you're saying? Yeah. That's what we are trying to point out. Vedanta says, what is enlightenment? That this is as clear and even more so an experience than all of these three. This is more of an experience than all of these three. Vedanta says, when? Now. And we are missing it. When? Every moment of our lives. Vedanta is trying to point it out to us. We just have to notice it. Relax. We just have to notice it. We have to recognize it. That's what Vedanta is saying. Don't be in a hurry. If it was so simple, everybody would be enlightened. <laughs> I'd be out of a job. <laughs> right. But you can see how close we are. Yes. Will it only enlighten the mind or fulfill the heart? Completely fulfill the heart. Beyond everything. Shantam, Shiva, Madhvaitam. Which, which, what, is, what does it say? This thing, if you realize yourself as this. Shantam means beyond all suffering. Shiva means bliss. Your Ananda Swarupa. The highest bliss. Completely beyond suffering. Just now we saw Nivritte Sarva Dukkhanam. All sorrows. All desires will be fulfilled. All sorrows removed. Removed in what sense? Transcended. Will it clear, cure my flu? No, no. That's why I'm saying transcended. What is in the waking state will remain in the waking state. What is in the dream state will remain in the dream state. But you are free from it. That's what's going to happen. Will it fulfill the heart? Yes. Without any doubt. And always. You don't, you don't even need to ask these questions. Look at the lives of Vivekananda, Ramana Maharshi or whatever the enlightened per people. Does Ramana Maharshi say, I am enlightened, I have got all the Advaita down pat, but I am really, you know, um, bored or uh, just sitting in this cave all my life. It's such a drag, I am sitting in this cave. <laughs> he never says that. Nobody says that. Vivekananda has tremendous activity till the last moment of his life. He doesn't say, oh, I was too busy, I didn't get time for meditation or spirituality, you know, that I am unfulfilled. No, completely fulfilled, all the time. No, not a layperson perspective, not, not permitted. It, you, are a, you are a Vedantic student. Yes, go ahead. They are just scaffoldings. Correct. And These are scaffoldings. The scaffolding falls apart. Yes. Then you have an experience. Or what, what you realize the truth, yes. And this is not a layperson's experience. A layperson's experience is these three. But these three are scaffolding for something. Absolutely true. That's what it says. These, these are the doorways to something. 
we take this to be the final reality. We have no idea about this one at all. This is something that Vedanta is trying to introduce us to. Don't worry, the introduction process will go on at least. This is just the first round. Somebody asked me, what's the best way to master Mandukya Karika? The best way is to repeat it a dozen times. <laughs> yeah. I think Swami, the problem in, in this structure of the scaffolding lies in the description of the state of sleep. Most of the sanskaras, the deep subconscious mind, probably lies in the state of sleep. Huh. And it's the purification of that deep subconscious mind that disentangles what is from what appears or where the entanglement lies means my, hum, my humble reading of understanding of uh, Gita says that our, our consciousness is entangled into this world. That's why we get, we get caught into this. So the process of disentanglement, the, the secret perhaps lies uh, in our deeper understanding of the state of sleep Maybe sleep is the word that has been used. So shukta, maybe there was some other meaning because this came from somebody who had an experience and they had no perhaps limited teaching because they were going out into the forest and they were experimenting with themselves and putting into words. What we haven't started today's teaching yet, remember. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what is the point? The, the point is, I think there may be... Uh, are the, my question is, are there other ways of looking at the scaffoldings? Other way, other scaffoldings that... Same thing can be viewed from Let's look at one scaffolding. It takes decades to master this one. And this is the highest teaching possible. Nobody dis- denies this. Mandukya Upanishad is supposed to be the most powerful and the Upanishad is, the Upanishadic teaching is the final acme of Hindu, uh, Hindu thought. Uh, so, let's, let's just master this. Now, just to answer your question. Um, you're saying the, the deep sleep, the, the, the samskaras which are there in the mind, they have to be purified I have listened to your question very carefully. When they are purified, then we will be able to discern what is from what appears to be. There itself, one must think. How do you distinguish what is from what appears to be? By purification of the mind or by knowledge? Tell me. In my experience, personal experience, I found that um, the more you purify, the more awareness detaches from the body mm. and, and is able to look at the body in a very objective way. The body is right. not you, you that realization a little bit even. So what I'm hearing is purification of the mind. See, I have answered this at least half a dozen times to my, my knowing. But it must sink in. So I'm answering it again here. The, what I'm hearing is purification of the mind enables this knowledge to work or, or clarifies. Suppose you have purified mind but no knowledge, will it work? No. Suppose an impure mind and this knowledge is given, will it work? No. It could, right? Because it could start the it, process. It could start the process, yes. Yeah. Now I have mentioned a number of times earlier. Do you remember the structure of sadhana? The three levels of sadhana, impurity in the mind is the problem. What is the solution? Purity of mind. What is the uh, sadhana spiritual practice for that? Karma yoga. Karma yoga. Distraction of the mind. Mind flickering and constantly going outwards is the problem. Vikshepa. What is the uh, solution? No, what is, the, what is the solution? Ekagra, the focus. What is the method? Meditation. 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 Upasana, raja yoga, bhakti yoga. Ignorance, not knowing that I am this is the problem. Then what is the solution? Knowledge. Knowledge. What is the method? Do you see this this structure? What you are referring to is a sadhana and absolutely necessary. But do you see the place in the structure? What I am speaking about and what you are speaking about? Is purification of the mind necessary? Absolutely. Is concentration of the mind necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. But they are all preliminary sadhanas. Purification of the mind, come to karma yoga class. Um, uh, concentration of mind, come to raja yoga class. But ultimately, you must realize what you are. This is the structure of uh, Vedanta. Come to Mandukya class. This is what we are talking about. Yes. May I ask you a question? So going back 
back to the question about why are we not having experiences? Is, is the, uh, I mean, my understanding is that the experiencer is the Tullian. And mm -hmm. so, like you said, the eyes, I have eyes and I see, but I don't see my own eyes. So it's not possible. If you are the experiencer, how would you experience the experiencer? So you have to, it's just, what is the question? <laughs> no, I'm just saying it cannot be an experience. The thurium, to know that you are Correct. Thurium. Yes, to know that your thurium is not a particular experience. Just like knowing that I have eyes does not mean that I have to see something particular. Anything, seeing anything reveals to me that I have got eyes. Hmm. You have a question? Yes. It's one way of saying, I won't, we don't normally use the language of acceptance because that's more the language of dualistic religion or theism because that leads to um, a kind of faith-based approach. But in one sense, you're right. Understanding this, see, for example, seeing all of this reveals to me what? First of all, it reveals, reveals to me you are all here. But also it reveals to me I have eyes and my eyes are functioning. Now, if I keep on doubting, do I, no, do I still have eyes? It's a theoretical idea. It's, it's a kind of concept that I've got eyes. Is it a concept? No. By seeing, looking at you, it reveals to me as eyes. It's a concept? No. At that point, I need to accept it. Yes, it's proved that I have got eyes. Okay. So, the thurium itself, your point was that the thurium is the experience of what did you say? I mean, because I got sidetracked. You said something interesting. Yes, just before no, this. I said that because it's, a, it's the thurium, when you first said that the waker, the dreamer, and the deep sleep are all aspects of the Atman, hmm. and the thurium is the basis of all of them. Yes. So the thurium is experiencing all these things. Yes. Then, but we, and so I think the only way we will know is when we know that we are the Turiyam. Yes. So it cannot, it cannot be an experience. It cannot be an object. Yeah. Yeah, it cannot be an object of experience. That's true. That's what we're saying. No? To, uh, it so, be a realization of something. Right. So it's, it has, that's why the word realization is good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not literally seeing or hearing or touching or smelling the Turiyam or something like that. You can't. But it's something more than that. That's why the uh, example of the eyes is very powerful. <coughs> you cannot see the eyes. But does that mean that you have, have some doubt about the existence of the eyes? You can see so many things and all of that constantly reveals to you that you have got eyes. Now, no, there was something else that was going on here which I wanted to respond to. Um, um, you said that we... Uh, about the lack of experiences. He says, he's looking for it because we, we are not having, oh, use the term, we are not having experiences. But that's what I wanted to point out. We are having experiences all the time. No. Isn't your life full of experiences? Right now, aren't you having an experience? No. What Advaita is asking is, how are you having that experience? What you are asking is, it's like saying, I need to see a specific thing that will prove to me that I've got eyes. What Advaita is saying, do you see anything at all? Yes, it proves that you've got eyes. That's what it boils down to. But don't worry, it'll come to that. And ultimately, if I have to give a straight answer to you, is it an experience or not? Yes, a hundred times, a thousand times, yes. When the breakthrough finally happens, it's, it's like the most tremendous experience ever. It's always life becomes before and after. One sign of that will be it'll never go away again. Every other kind of experience, every mystical experience of Kali or Jesus or Krishna comes and goes. This never goes away. Um, is the purity of the mind and the concentration, are those prerequisites for this? I'll let you all answer now. Yeah. Yes. 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 Because, you know, 
think about holding this realization over long periods of time, you know, I think before you speak, I'm going to um, catch you at every word. What's your name? Costa. So are you holding on to that my name is Costa all the time? Isn't it kind of effortless? Even though it was something that was taught to you when you were a baby. So holding this experience or this realization over a lifetime, already in this a terrible mistake is there. It's like... I am imagining I am Shiva. Now, as long as I imagine I am Shiva, yeah, then I'm holding on to it. It's an imagination. I am not at all. Heaven forbid. Never think I'm trying to ask you to imagine I am Turiya. No, that's an imagination. It has to be a realization. Like you know that you are Kostav. You don't imagine that you're Kostav. You know that you're Kostav. Effortlessly. Always available to you. And, you. and I just asked you, what's your name? Immediately, Kostav. Where you continuously, from the time you were named Kostav till now, is the background, it's running, I am Kostav, I am Kostav, I am Kostav. No. You don't feel the need for that. Exactly like that and even more so, once the realization is there, it's there. The waker, you are all wake, you're in the waking state, we are all waker now. Do you continuously need to hold on to the fact, I am waking, I am waking, I am the waker, I am the waker? No. It's a given fact for me. It will be a given fact, more than anything else, that I am the witness consciousness, Turiya. The reason I asked is because this is, you know, you, you, it's not like you are in the waking state. It's not a state as such. And so, you know, if you just identify with the objects that you see around you versus the consciousness, so do we, we don't need to keep that in mind, but at the same time, we should. it should be like, once you have realized, you don't come, you know, you don't sink back to the attachments or mm -hmm. the, the, the worldly things. Is that, you know, because I, one thing is the intellectual part that she was talking about. And I, I'm trying to understand, that's why I asked the question, like, are the other two prerequisites? Because the more you do karma yoga, the more you do raja yoga, then you're better prepared for once you you know, intellectually you are aware of the consciousness, you can hold on to it for a long period of time. Is, is that clear, my question? Or? Mm. Yes. And the simple answer to that is yes. That's the whole idea of adhikari. I think we have sort of put the cart before the horse here. Yeah. <laughs> that do you need to do karma yoga and purify the mind? A thousand times yes. Do you need to meditate and concentrate, have a concentrated mind? A thousand times yes. Why? Because it's absolutely necessary for making the breakthrough. Otherwise what will happen is the breakthrough will not come and as you sort of intuited, even if you get the breakthrough, it will get clouded over very fast. But here we are talking about the core teaching. Here I'm not teaching how to sit in asana and meditate. Those teachings are valid in their own sphere. Here I'm teaching, uh, talking about the central teaching. Now remember, this is, I'm not annoyed that you're asking these questions. All these questions are indicative that for the first time Vedanta is sinking in. That's why we get upset. Otherwise you've been hearing all your life, uh, I am Brahman and or something is there, you will get some kind of experience in the future. The vaguest of stuff. That's why the questions never came. Now the questions are coming for the first time. We are beginning to understand what this, this, this text is actually saying. The really radical claim of this text. We have been hearing, Brahman is here all the time. But what does it mean Brahman is here all the time? You are actually claiming that I am God right now. What a tremendous uh, claim it is. Then only these questions come. I remember, and the, the same question, many of the same questions come when we are in the monks talking with our teachers there in MLS. I remember Ramana Saraswati was there. Somebody asked a similar question. I don't know if you're asking that question exactly. One young monk asked a question in sort of exasperation. There's like this intense discussion and finally this young monk asked the question. But at least Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I must, that much only I must hold on to, right? You're saying meditation is no, it's not meditation, it's not bhakti, it's not karma. It's knowledge always available to you. But I must hold on to that. I am Brahman, right? And then the teacher, 
Ramananda Saraswati, he said, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate into English. Wahi to nahi karna hai. That's exactly what you must not do. As long as you're doing that, you're thinking of something. You're imagining something. You're practicing something. Do you keep on thinking that I am Kaustuk? No. Are you practicing I am Kaustuk? No. It's become a, a, a fact. But, but it's very hard, you know, because you need a lot of preparation for it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's, that's my fault because some people say you make it sound suspiciously easy. Yes, if it were so easy, we would all have <laughs> broken through. But you know one thing? I'll still put it out there. It is easy. It is the most difficult thing in the world if you choose to make it so. But it's also the easiest thing in the world. Why should it, think about it logically, why should it not be the easiest thing in the world? Because you are it. Why should it be so difficult? Yeah. Just for me, I think the problem is it's easy to grasp it intellectually to understand it. Okay? okay. No, no. No. Let me let me. <laughs> no, I'm not cutting you off. I'm I'm trying to trying to m- m- make you slow down. Okay. I'm always saying and slow down. The problem mm. comes is remember in one of the early lectures last year when you began, I think it Panchadashi. was uh, Panchadashi maybe you had given those and you even began uh, the Mandukya with it. I think there are six aspects or four. I forget, Vairagya, Viveka, yeah, I mean, I think unless one is really steeped in that, at least that's my experience, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unless that happens, this experience of um, consciousness as such, it really comes and goes, I mean, you know, sometimes you feel, yeah, you know, without telling yourself constantly, but it's only an... I mean, I feel that what these classes and what thinking about it is doing, sorry, I'm personalizing it, is that it's beginning to make me a better person. And I feel that once, I mean, as I progress as a person, then at some stage, simultaneously thinking about this, it will gel. I'm hoping. (laughs) I'm hoping. My response to that is twofold. One is, yes, you're right, absolutely right. As we go along, this begins to sink in. At one time, it will definitely gel. Especially if you do sadhana, it will gel. For the nth number of time, you must do karma yoga, you must do bhakti yoga, you must do raja yoga, then it will gel. But quite apart from that, I will not let you off the hook. I will still say at this moment also, it can gel right now, right here. It is possible. That is one thing I want to I want to push. Why why would you want to postpone it for the next thirty years? No, not postpone it, but it should because it's going to happen on its own, right? It's I mean I make the effort towards effort in the sense. No, the effort effort the effort right. Requiring knowledge. The effort right now is to postpone it. (laughs) No. No, wait, wait, wait. But no, no, I'm no. trying to say something. Listen, listen. Listen carefully. You, I'm listening to what you are saying. What I'm saying is you are not listening to what I'm saying. I can repeat back your words. You can't repeat back mine. You short listen. Term not short term memory. We are listening to our own thinking, not to the teacher's words. Look at the words you use. There itself is the door. This is a doorway to enlightenment. You just use some words which is the doorway to enlightenment. You say that this experience of consciousness, why which you meant this understanding of consciousness, it comes and goes. Is use that word? Did you use it or not? Yes. Huh? That it comes and goes. Do you experience that? Yes. What experience is it? Does that come and go? Does that come and go? Take it seriously. Hmm. That to which the understanding appeared, that to which it got confused and dissolved away, that one, does it come and go? Does it get confused?
It is the witness of understanding, it is the witness of forgetting, it is the witness of confusion. That one is never confused. So that, that thou art, that you are. Even if I haven't really acquired Vairagya as much, it is still possible? Yes. What will happen is, this is discussed in, by, in Yuvan Mukti Viveka by Vidyaranya. There's a whole text about this. It says that even enlightenment is possible even when the sadhan chatushtha, the fourfold qualifications are not at their peak. To bring it to their peak is lifetime's effort. Even before that, a breakthrough is possible. But what will happen is, after that breakthrough, one must again do sadhana. To become established in that. That's what you're asking. Yeah. That's what I'm saying is, don't worry about these ancillary things. In these classes, try to absorb the one central message, this one. Once you have made the breakthrough, even in intellectually, if it is clear, intellectually only, it's a great, great thing. It's a great gift in this one life. If it's just intellectually clear also, it's a great gift. This intellectual clarity deepens into spiritual realization, what you are asking for. These are not two separate things. In, Gyan, in Raja Yoga, for example, when you learn about Ashtanga Yoga and all of that, you have to learn it intellectually and then go out, go out and do it. If you don't do it, it's of no use. In Jnana Yoga, what we are doing here, you have to learn it, understand it and deepen that understanding itself. There's nothing else to be done. That's why stay with this. I can point out this, this reality almost through any one of these questions. But you have to stay with the question. I can go on. In, 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 you know, when we were teaching there, um, I've seen in the monks when we discuss, two hours, three hours. Basically, they have taken up one person. and That person is grilled for two, three, four hours. Till that person either has the breakthrough or gives up because in order to get, <laughs> be free of all of this. But if you jump from one question to another question to another question, then the focus is lost. Again, I will say, you must complete the whole thing. What did I say? Because otherwise, these questions branch off from one to another. And we only, only in fragments. What, the, what, is, what is the context in which I said it? You must remember the whole context. If one has not done sadhana earlier and makes a breakthrough, is it possible at all? Yes, it is possible. I am not saying it. All the ancients say it. By the grace of God or Guru or whatever, it is possible to make a breakthrough. Afterwards, again, sadhana is necessary to become established in that. At, but that sadhana is very, very, same sadhana I will continue, same japa, dhyana and everything. But the approach is totally different there. Here we are seeking. There you have already found it, you are not seeking anymore. You are trying to be established in it. So that stages sthita pragya? No. That after being established in that is sthita pragya. Sthita means oh, established. established. The very word is established. Alright. Now... Another reason, I remember everything. I don't know, you, you might think, another what reason? <laughs> everything I remember. I remember this is what we were discussing. This is what, there's one more thing to be said here. And uh, I have not started the class yet, actually. And we are, it's 5, 5, 30. Okay. Whole question was, let me remind you, an experience. We want an experience. Why? Because the experience will prove it. I've shown you that you, no particular experience will prove it. Every experience is a proof of that your thurium, if, if thurium is understood properly. To see or meet God, you are trying to objectify. It's not an object. Even if you objectify, I told you, even if you do have many, many mystical experiences, I'm telling you ultimately it is valueless if it does not do something for you. That was what I pointed out. Third point here was, reason why we are seeking an experience is to deny this experience. It's an important point. We think this is worldly, I need a spiritual experience. This is horrible, I need a sublime experience. This is no peace here. I used to sit here and quietly find peace within. Yeah, I used to think like that. It's normal, that's how spiritual life begins. But what is this pointing out? 
All of these experiences are nothing but the experience of Turiya. When you actually become enlightened, you will find it here itself, in this life itself, in the waking itself. You will find that, that, that reality. Sri Ramakrishna said in Bengali, um, the, the one who has got it here, Jajar, um, that means one who keeps saying it's there in heaven in that place will not find God here or there. One who keeps saying it's then you know after death or after enlightenment after experience after samadhi will not find it there or here. The one who finds it here will find it both here and there. You have to fi- you, you will find it here. It's like saying. I understand the reality is gold. Let me throw away all these horrible things called ornaments and look for the reality called gold. You'll never find it. Where is the gold? That very thing which is appearing to you as the necklace, that very thing which is appearing to you as the bangle or the ring, that is gold. Vivekananda said, I often quote this, that he who runs away from life to meditate and die, you know, seeking God in a Himalayan cave, has missed the way. He who plunges headlong into the vanities of life, has missed the way. Now, how strange, if you run away from life, you've missed the way. If you plunge into life, you've missed the way. Then what is the way? He says, the way is to defy life itself. In, in wherever you are, with whomever you are, in whatever situation you are, find God there. Seeing God everywhere, that is the solution. Because that is, that's what it is. Hmm. If you take the necklace as the reality, you have missed it. Because the necklace is not the reality. The underlying gold is the reality. If you throw away the necklace to find something called gold, again you have missed it. You will never find it. You have thrown it away. Alright. So, we try to deny this experience. That's why we keep hankering for other experience. Don't worry. Are other experiences available? I am not denying it. Of course there are fantastic experiences available. But, beyond, I am telling you, at least a little bit from personal experience, beyond those mystical experiences, very soon you will seek for something beyond that, something permanent and deeper. This is that. I know from one person's experience, he had a breakthrough like that. A young monk. You know what was what his first reaction? To completely ignore it and watch. Is it like those other, you know, mystical experiences which come which fill you with joy and peace and then slowly disappear, become a nice memory and life goes on. Is it like that? And no, it was not. Waking, dreaming, every moment it was filled with that experience, with that knowledge. You cannot drive it away once it's there. So, yes, is it an experience? Yes, indeed, you might say it's an experience, but it is beyond every other experience. It is unchangeable, undeniable. You can't even try it. After that, after that, if you, if you don't do any sadhana also, if you try to drive it away, disprove it, you cannot. It's like trying to look, looking straight at the sun and saying that there's, I don't see the sun. You are seeing it. There is no other way of, no, no way of driving it away from your life again. It's so powerful, so undeniable. So, yes. Then you will not worry that I have to take this experience away and then give, get another experience. You won't worry. Will other experiences come? If you keep on doing sadhana, other experiences will come. Definitely. But then you will not really need them anymore. They will be all entertainment for you. Okay. Now we were asking, how is it that the Turiyam, I'll just end with that. How is it that the Turiyam is not affected by any of this? We said first thing, detached, asanga. Second thing, it is the illuminer, like light is not affected by what it illumines. But the third and most important thing, it is satyam, the real. In comparison to all these things which are mithya, the real rope is not affected by the false snake. The real desert is not wetted even a little bit by the false water of the mirage. The real sky is not made blue because of the appearance of the blue, blue color in the sky. No. Reality is never affected by appearance. The reality is Turiyam, waking, dreaming and sleeping with all their properties, with all their problems and anxieties and terrors are appearances. No more than the false snake can make the real rope uh, poisonous. No more than the water of the mirage can make the 
um, sand of the desert wet, uh, no more than that can any of this really affect you, the thurium. Because it's real, these are appearances. Because it's the illuminer and the, these are illumined. Because in, the, in it, these appear and disappear, it is asanga, detached. Because of these three reasons, the thuria is not affected by the sufferings of the world and hence, nivritte sarva dukkhana, all sufferings are transcended, even when they continue to appear. Everything will continue exactly the way it is. It continues to appear, but you are not touched by it. Then, Advaita Sarva Bhavanam, the next word. Advaita Sarva Bhavanam. I think we have run out of time completely. Okay, we'll take it up next time. Good, this is a good, today was a Q&A session more or less, <laughs> rather than progress. But um, it's good to have these sessions once in a while because it clears up accumulated doubts otherwise. Do you think we made progress? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Good. Always. <laughs> All right. Today we won't do the Om meditation. We've run out of uh, over time. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu